After a very long break, Baruch uh, Hashem, we're back online. The long break, I mean, for the ones online, it's a long break. You see me every day. But uh, one long break in regards to the lectures going online, of course, was because uh, the fabulous YouTube and other platforms decided to block, uh, block my channel, remove videos, and censor what I had to say. And regarding, besides that, a few other things. So, Baruch Hashem, it's all good now. I think, we didn't try it, that the block is uh, over. We're going to try with this video to load it up and see what happens. And uh, many want, wanted to know how I'm doing. I mean, again, you see me every day. People online don't see me. They don't know what's going on. So, Baruch Hashem, I'm alive and well, and I'm not in some uh, basement of the Shabak being tortured. Why am I going against the government? So it's all good, Baruch Hashem. And... Uh, and uh, I prepared a few lectures. I, of course, we're not going to do it all in one shot. Today we're going to talk about one topic. But uh, there's a few other topics uh, that I've already prepared lectures and we're going to have to go through, which of course are all about current affairs and what's going on and what's the next move. After all, things are going on in the world, things are happening. And uh, it's very important to, to follow what's going on and to see what the Torah has to say about it. Today, specifically, I want to talk about uh, the disaster that happened in Meron. And not because I wanted to talk about it, because after it happened, I think I got a few thousand emails and messages of people asking, what do you think, why do you think it happened? What do you think uh, is the message? What do we have to take from that? Which I didn't really feel like uh, giving my two cents of the matter, besides the fact that it was obvious, very obvious, that it happened in a deliberate way, it wasn't an accident, it was pretty obvious, not pretty, very obvious that it was planned. The plan, of course, was to get much more casualties and there was a ma huge miracle and it was only a 45. That's number one. I'm not going to talk about that right now. People get very touchy and upset when you talk about things like this. But the fact is it was planned. It wasn't a mistake. You clearly saw how the police stopped the pathway. The police removed all the cameras. Two days before that, everything was planned, and it was planned to be a disaster. It was a disaster, but on a scale of thousands. And Baruch Hashem, there was a miracle, and it was only 45. And, uh, but this, it's less important why, because after all, even if uh, a human being planned it, there was still the hand of God that allowed it. So there's a very profound message, there's a lot of messages behind it, which we're going to kind of go through this today. But... Nevertheless, uh, we also have to understand that the Hashem is telling us something. And then, of course, right after that, uh, there was the whole uh, mini-war right now and the riots in Israel and many other things that, uh, of course, everything is not happening by chance. Everything is planned. So we're going to have to see what the Holy Torah has to say about that and how is that to do with me, what I, where I'm coming into this picture. But uh, before we start, uh, for at least for the viewers online, I have a few uh, uh, good news, happy news. We started working on our smartphone app, which uh, was going to be a very, very powerful app where all the videos, courses, lectures are all going to be there, plus many other things, amazing, amazing things. So anyone who's interested to see what's going on, when it's coming, especially uh, uh, to participate, then we're going to put underneath the video the link where you can visit it, which will probably be on the smooth.org forward slash app. But you can see everything that's going on. And uh, it's going to be real special app. It will come in stages. It's not going to come in one shot because we have to do one uh, feature at a time. We're also going to start, this should be also good news for you. We're going to start a few very interesting courses that we were waiting for a while uh, that will also be posted on Atzmut. And the first one is going to be the Gates of Reincarnation, Shara Gilgulim by the Arizal. The other one will be Sharek Dusha, Gates of Holiness. Uh, two things we already started about Kochav Yaakov, the Planet X, Nibiru. Here we already started. Another one was, is the letters in the names. Some of it we already started. But Baruch Hashem, we're going to continue. And for the ones who are online, they can definitely join all these uh, wonderful teachings. Now, as I said before, many things are happening lately but specifically in the land of Israel. And like I said before, uh, the incident in Meron, and after that the riots, and the barrage of rockets, and a few other things. 
And even though it's happening in the land of Israel, and it's important to understand land of Israel, I'm not talking about the country of Israel, country and land is two different things. <coughs> but since it's happening in the land of Israel, and the land of Israel is the center of the world, then it is not only for the Jews or for the residents of the lands of Israel to understand, it's for everybody. So anything that has to do with Israel, of course, it's applying to all Jews around the world, which simultaneously many Jews around the world are experiencing a lot of anti-Semitism in New York, in Los Angeles, in uh, many other places, in London, in uh, Montreal. But when something happens in the land of Israel, it's for the whole world to understand that something's going on. Because the land of Israel is the land of the Kadosh Baruch It doesn't belong to anybody. It doesn't belong not to the Israelis and not to the Palestinians. It's, it belongs to the master of the universe. And he will decide who will inhabit and occupy it. Right now, it's, uh, we, we are living here. But there's no question that the, the evil regime is controlling it. We're not controlled by Torah... Uh, laws here till Mashiach is going to come which is already a problem but when things happen in the land of Israel it's not only for us to take something for that it's for the Jews, Jews all around the world and it's for any human being around the world Jews and non-Jews alike so even people who are not Jewish this has to do with them too it's also a big part of it and uh, you know we just went through a whole year which for many people, it was a year full of fear and anxiety and uncertainty uh, with the pandemic and everything that has to do with that. And uh, up until now, it doesn't matter where people are, there's still a lot of confusion and, and fear and, uh, and, as I said, uncertainty because nobody knows what's going on. Amazingly, I don't know if you noticed that we had corona for a year and a half and then uh, when the barrage of missiles started falling on Israel and riots, the corona disappeared. Suddenly, I don't know, the corona maybe is, uh, is, uh, has a, uh, a weakness for missiles or whatever it is. But suddenly the corona disappeared. For 15 days, we didn't hear about anything about the corona. And miraculously, the 30 minutes after the so-called ceasefire was uh, announced, the news are announcing 33 new uh, corona cases were found in Israel, so the corona is back in town. And uh, every day they invent something new. So we have to really focus on what's going on here and see what does Hashem want from us. Because I, from when I talk to people here in Israel and outside of Israel, the main thing that people project is that this, because of the uncertainty of what's going on, some type of fear. Fear or, you know, the word in Hebrew would be more precise to say charada, that, that it's not just I'm afraid of something, it's more deeper. And when a person is, is uh, attacked by fear, fear from the future, fear what's going to happen, what's going to be in a month, what's going to be in a day, and so forth, then a person needs to meditate really what is the message behind it. And more than that, when Hashem puts some type of a problem on us, it's for me to really look at myself and to decide how can I better myself when, uh, 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 and my, for my behavior. But more than that, when we are attacked with fear, is a message from Hashem to tell me, look inside yourself how you can uproot hate and separation in your heart. And the sad reality is that even as much as people pretend that they don't, but we all have a lot of hate in us towards other people. And needless to say, with the hate comes a lot of separation. And I'm not talking about uh, necessarily things that are on the surface, but we all carry within us a lot of hate. If, uh, whether it's Jews and non-Jews or in the, the Jewish uh, 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 group, the religious and the non-religious and in the religious people, so the Ashkenazi and the Sephardi and this group and that group and, and in communities and in shuls, everywhere there's all, all the time this, this hate. And the hate will always going to cause separation, which is our problem. Now, going back to the topic, what we are going to cover today is about the disaster that happened in the, the mountain of Miron on the very special day of Lagba Omer. And even though some time already has passed, almost a month, but nevertheless, uh, it has to be understood what does Hashem want from us. 
Uh, next class will be, we will talk about how, how could it be that we didn't even finish the morning of, uh, of the disaster of Meron and right away Israel is being attacked with barrage of, barrage of missiles, which we're not going to touch in this lecture if we really were attacked by barrage of missiles or it was maybe just one big show. But this we're not going to talk about right now. But we also experienced all the riots in Israel. We never had such a thing. Well, many, many times we were attacked by uh, missiles by our enemies, but riots inside of Israel, that we never had in that scale. And, and we have to see, so we're going to break it into a few classes. So let's start with the class with Meron, and this is a very deep and profound message. So 45 holy souls died, I would like to say publicly murdered, but uh, that's what happened. They were murdered, but 45 holy souls died. 45 is a very profound number. First of all, it's the numerical values, the gematria of the word Adam. And everything that happens to us as a personal individual or as a whole is one fraction of the rectification of the sin of Adam Arishon. It's called Tikkun Adam, Tikkun Chet, chet Etz Adat. Adam Arishon sinned, and we have to correct it with many different ways. So already we see uh, 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 first interesting digit that 45 could have been 46 and it be, could be 44. Why 45? Then we're going to find out many reasons why 45 and what are the messages here. But the first thing that struck me at least is, is uh, first thing that struck me is that 45 is the numerical value of the word geula, redemption. Hashem is telling us, buckle up, the redemption is coming and it's not coming with a, with a sil silver platter and it's going to come nice. It's going to come with a lot of hardship. Second thing that I thought of was, yeah, 45 is the Minyan of Adam. This is part of the Tikkun of Adam Arishon. Now it happened in a chain of, of, uh, of uh, parashot, which I found very interesting. It happened in Parashat Emo, which we're going to touch this in a second. And right after that were another two parashot that were attached, Behar Bechukotai. And right away I was like, wow, this is unbelievable, because where did the whole thing happen? Behar Meron, in the mountain of Meron. Har means a mountain. And right after that, and attached in the same week, is Parashat Bechukotai, where we read about the 98 curses in the Torah, that when you hear the curses, it's very even hard to digest that why would the Torah explain to me that if I don't follow what Hashem says, I mean, the curses are like beyond what a human mind can understand. And this all happens in that time. Now, really what was going on in Parashat Bechukotai, the majority, I mean, I would say the main theme of Parashat Bechukotai is a warning of Moshe Rabbeinu. I mean, Moshe Rabbeinu is the one who's talking. He's warning the nation of Israel what to do and what not to do before going into the land of Israel. And why is that so specific, uh, important? Because the land of Israel, as I mentioned before, first of all belongs to the master of the universe, doesn't belong to anybody. Nobody can come and claim ownership on the land. And at this point, not the Palestinians and not the Jews. The land belongs to God, period. There's no way to argue with it. And God will decide who he wants to give it to. If he wants to give it to the Jews, that's his uh, choice. But the land belongs to the master of the universe. And more than that, the land of Israel is like the, the apple of the eye of Hashem. That's how it's called, Mabat Aino. And where do we see it in the most profound way? Next week, we're going to learn about the story with Shlach Lecha, with Shlach, with the sending of the, of the spies which we talked about it not once and not twice, that up until today, that sin was never forgiven. And why was that sin never forgiven? Because the spies spoke Lashon Ara about the land of Israel. Speak Lashon Ara about anything else, Hashem will forgive you. But you speak Lashon Ara about the land of Israel, then you're going to have a serious problem. And that sin, the sin of the spies, was never forgiven up until today. Because Hashem says, there's certain things that I will oversee and certain things I won't. And there's not going to be such an easy way to do tshuva. And in Parashat Bechukotai is when Moshe Rabbeinu is warning the nation, if you're not going to listen, then this is what's going to happen. And really, when you're going through the 98 curses, it's, it's, it's a holocaust. He's, he's predicting 
uh, holocaust one after the other. And when? Right before you're going into the land of Israel. So you have to be double careful when it has to do with the land of Israel. Now, <clears throat> as I said before, that many of our uh, challenges is not only because our own sins, but because we have to do a rectification to the sin of Adam Marishon. But more than that, if I do a certain sin, and I don't do tshuva, I don't repent, and I don't do a rectification, then I'm going to have a problem, whether before I leave this world or after I leave this world. Mm -hmm. That's why it's extremely important for every individual to catch themselves and to say, I don't know, you know what, I'm not going to live forever. One day I'm also going to be placed in the ground, unless Mashiach comes tonight and now we're no more death. But a person has to do an account. Wait a minute, I have 50, 60, 70 years of sins, did I really do a tikkun for that? That fact that you grew a beard and you put a yamaka on, that's very nice of you. Who said you did a rectification for your sin? It's called a tikkun. Now, Hashem is so kind that if a person did not do a tikkun, a rectification to his sins, that Hashem will do it for him, and usually it will be done by death. That's how it usually is done. If you don't do it, then the Kadosh Baruch says, okay, I will kill you for that. And sometimes the death is what's called mita meshuna, very weird death. Or chas v'shalom in a very uh, 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 derogatory word, where, way. But nevertheless, if you don't do it, then Hashem will do it for you. Now, the biggest question that I had when I saw this disaster in Meron is why did they kill each other? You know, they could have gone on a bus, all these 45 souls, and the bus would fall off the cliff, chas v'shalom, or explode. Or what, why they all killed each other? Nobody died by, 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 by uh, falling by themselves. Or chas uh, v'shalom, a shot. Or they killed each other. They were standing on each other. Up until today, I'm still trying to figure out be beyond that. There are four types of deaths by the, by the court. And one of them is by suffocation. So, for example, if a person desecrates Shabbat, then the death is by stoning. And it doesn't have to be stones per se. You know, in our generation, the stoning can be like a car accident. That's what many great rabbis are saying. That in our generation in Israel, the death toll by car accidents is out of proportions. Because when, you, when the car rolls and a person gets hit from all directions and dies because of it, that's like stoning. So I'm still trying to figure out what is the focus on the suffocation. But we'll put this aside for now. The question that I want to ask is that's the question that I ask myself. Why did they kill each other? Can't you kill them in another way? There's no question that these four 45 souls were holy souls that you can't even imagine. You look at their faces, you see these pure, pure souls. And half of them were kids. Of course, they didn't have their own sins. You see on their faces they were holy. They obviously died for us. They obviously died as an atonement. But nevertheless, why did they kill each other? Okay? Now, so let's go back to the parasha that we talked about with all the curses. And you might want to open a chumash. If not, just follow. Later on, you can open the chumash and follow. But if you do, open the, the, the chumash and follow the psukim, the verses that we're going to be reading. And, uh, and if you have it with a translation, even better. For the ones who speak English, I don't like the translations because the word in Hebrew makes much more sense, but we'll explain it all. So go to Parashat Bechukotai, exactly where all the curses are, which is tra chapter 26. And we're going to start with verse 37. Pasuk Lamed Zayin. But before we start, this is where I want to focus on, but before we start with, chapter, with the, uh, verse 37, go to verse 36. And what does it say there? It says there very clearly, Hashem is explaining to us, that if we do not observe Shabbat, and we will not observe the sabbatical year, then the land will, will, so to say, throw us out, and the result will be that we're going to be scattered among all the nations. Okay, and that's really what happened. There wasn't uh, observance of the sabbatical year, what's called Shemitah, wasn't observance of Shabbat, and the result is that we were scattered, and up until today, among, amongst all the nations. Now, <clears throat> first of all, it's very important that, to understand that all these warnings that we're getting in this parasha, it's Moshe Rabbeinu saying that. But nevertheless, the warnings are coming from Hashem. And why is it important to, uh, to understand that it's coming from Moshe? 
because if you flip the letters of Moshe, you read it Hashem. So Moshe is speaking in the name of Hashem. Hashem is God, of course. But not only that, the acronym of the word Moshe is a verse that I like saying a lot, Masha'ya Ushiye. This is a quoting Kohelet, what Shlomo Amalek says, what was is what will be. So what we, what they experienced then, that we're going to experience everything. The Midrash says, and many other sources says, that exactly what happened in the redemption of Egypt, we're going to have a carbon copy, exactly we're going to have it now. So what does it say in verse 36? Ve'hanisharim b'chem, ve'hanisharim b'chem, the one that will remain, and it says, ve'avti morach bilvavam. Let me just read the verse in English, I think it will be easier. I will bring fear in their hearts. The ones who remain, I will bring fear in their hearts. And uh, uh, in the land, uh, and sorry, and the, the lands of their enemies, and the sound of a rustling leaf will pursue them, and they will flee as one flees from a sword. Okay, that's what the verse says. That Hashem will bring fear into their hearts. And uh, the, 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 the instruction that he says, that, you know, when a leaf falls, it makes a noise. Like, you know, you go walking in the forest, the leaves, I don't know how you say it, they hit each other or the wind, they make noise that a person will hear like something like a leaf and will be trembling from fear, like as if somebody's coming to kill them. Uh, very few people can relate but, uh, you know, if, if a person is in a very bad situation and he feels he's about to die, imagine now we saw all these riots. Imagine an individual standing and there's a mob of people coming to attack him and that person starts getting attacked and beat up by the mob. Can you imagine what's going on in that person's mind right now? I'm being attacked, uh, there's like 30 of them, and then he feels, of course, the pain <laughs> of the attack. And in his mind, can you imagine the fear that that person is going through? This is fear that is very hard to... To, to digest, it's because you know, you have no chance, they, they can kill you. Especially when they're, you know, starting attacking you with stones and bats or whatever it is. Just a mad try to get into that place of fear. So Hashem says here that you're going to get to the same level of fear even just because you hear a sound of a leaf. Something that you're afraid of a leaf, but that will bring you the same level of fear. Now, it says a very interesting word, and it says in Hebrew, venaflu, and they will fall. So already we see what was going on there in, the, in that very short, uh, 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 narrow corridor, that how did it happen, that the first line of people fell down from the pressure, and then the rest started stepping all over them. But it says here in the, in the verse in 36, venaflu, and they will fall. Now, you continue to verse 37 and it says, uh, and they will fall, each man will stumble over his brother. Okay? So again, if you want to read again, this is in chapter 26, verse 37. And what does it say? And they will fall, each man will stumble over his brother. That's exactly what was going on there. And then it continues and it says, you will not be able to stand up, a comma, which that's what happened. Can you imagine 1,500 people pushing one the other and the ones in the front, what happens? Can you imagine how it looks? Forget about how it feels. I mean, there's not a lot of footage with which, which, from what was going on because the police took care of it the two days prior to the event. They removed all the cameras from the road. And they took to consideration that most Haredi, Orthodox, Hasidic individuals that will come don't have smartphones to film what's going on. Because there's not a lot of footage of what's, what's going on there. But for the ones who were there, you saw what was going on. I mean, I don't know who from you were there. The, the, the site was not a normal site. It didn't look normal at all. But what was going on there, that the first line of people got to the end, the police stopped them, and, and they started like a uh, pressure from all the people coming. And at some point, the ones in the front line fell down. Because can you imagine what pressure it is? I'm assuming here that you're talking here about 10, 15 tons of people. Not tons, like tons of weight. People pushing and pushing and pushing. It's not normal pressure. 
So the first ones fail, as it says, and they will fall. And after that, what does the verse says? Each man will stumble over his brother, which exactly what happened. And then the verse continues, you will not be able to stand up. Can you imagine you have 40 people on you? How can you stand up? You can't. But if you continue listening to the, reading the verse, it says something very interesting. You will not be able to stand up against your enemies. So if you put the comma, you will not be able to stand up because you have dozens of people over you. But let's remove the comma for a second. Against your enemies. This is the next thing we need to take, but fear we're just going to escape. Just remember the against your enemies. And this is the first hint that we have with what was going on there. Now, when you look, read the Torah, most people when they read, the commentary that they read is Rashi. That's the common commentator. But the ones who uh, are more interested to find more interpretations and commentary, then there are many other commentaries. One of them is called Kliakar. The ones who are reading what's called Mikrot Gdolot, that usually will come with either four commentaries or eight commentaries. One of them, which is very, very known, is called Kliakar. Kliakar is a rabbi called Rabbi Shlomo Ephraim, lived about 450 years ago, and very, very uh, deep and profound commentary. And he says something very interesting. The verse says, Vekashlu ish be'achiv. That's what the verse says. The translation, each man will stumble over his brother. That's the translation. But the translation is never good. The Hebrew means vekashlu, and they failed. Ish be'achiv, a person and his brother. Now, what does the Kliakar say? This is a commentary. Ki lo nizhar bechvod achiv. They are not cautious or they don't have the respect for the honor of his brother. Again, these are words, it's, it's a little bit hard to translate, but the Hebrew, again, ki lo nizhar bechvod achiv. That the one is not uh, 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 respectful enough to the honor of his brother. What is really the, what it means? It's called Perut Levavot. That's what the clear car says. Perut Levavot is that the hearts are separated. So we have here a commentary saying, why did they stand all over each other? I mean, this is physically, because they don't give respect to each other. Now, very interestingly, I don't want to say the word ironic, but very interestingly, this is the day, the, the 33 day of the Omer is the day that the 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva who did not give respect to each other, that's the day they died, they stopped dying. And the Kliakar says, what does it mean that they, uh, that they, uh, uh, and they will, uh, uh, each one, each man will stumble over his brother? That they don't give respect to each other. That's very interesting what the Kliakar says. And that's the first, the second big hint that we have here. Now, if you go three verses back to 33, which again happened on the 33rd day of the Omer, unbelievable, but to the 33rd verse, it says as follows, <coughs> That's what it says in the verse. And again, it says, all in the curses, the translation, and I will scatter you among the nations. This is one of the punishments that Hashem says, yeah, you're not going to do what I tell you, specifically with observing Shabbat and the sabbatical year, I will scatter you all over the nations. Now, the word in Hebrew, ezare, I mean, the translation means to scatter. But uh, the, the one can explain it in Hebrew with the word afazer, that I will take and separate. And, you know, this word is used when a farmer takes the seeds and throws them like that. Then you spread the seeds. You don't want them all in one place. You want the seeds to spread all over the place. And then they grow in different places. This is the word that it's using. Now... The commentary says, Kol echad dochefet chavero. Now, when I have seeds in my hand and I throw them like that, then they, when they bump each other, they go to different places. Right? That's physically what happens. So what does he say here? Each one pushes his friend. And so what does the clear car say? How? How each one pushes his friend? Belashonara. With slander and gossip 
and so forth. Okay, so here we have the first commentary that we read and another hint of what's going on. Now it comes and says something very, very interesting. We're going to uh, quote two pages in the Gemara, one from Tractate Shavuot, and page 49a, and the other uh, Talmud is from the Talmud of Shabbat, page uh, 70. Interestingly, in Tractate Shavuot, Shavuot means uh, oaths, but it also sounds like Shavuot, the holiday of Shavuot, which again, around the time of Shavuot, but what does it say there? In page 39a, it says, the Talmud is asking a question. Why doesn't it say Mipnei Achiv and it says Be'achiv? Okay, that's the verse that we're, that we're reading in, 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 the, in the parasha. So the Talmud says, and again, in English it's very hard to really translate it because there's a difference, Mipnei Achiv, because for his brother, but it says Be'achiv. In his brother. And again, the translation doesn't sound so right, but it's a play of the words because in Hebrew, sometimes you change one letter, it's a completely different meaning. Because what does the verse say? The verse says, Vekashlu uh, ish be'achiv. The translation is, each man will stumble over his brother. That's, that's a, you know, very simple translation. Vekashlu ish be'achiv, they failed a man in his brother. So the Talmud is asking, why is he saying in his brother? Be'achiv. It should say, Mipnei achiv. That I'm failing by slandering my brother in, in his face. Mipnei. So that's the question the Talmud is asking. So, the, of course, when the Talmud asks the questions, it gives an answer. Be'avon, echa, be'ach, be'avon achiv. That the stumbling here is in the sin of the brother, not my sin. I get punished because of a sin you did. That's what the Talmud says. Be'achiv is that I get, kashlu, the translation maybe, it says here, uh, uh, one man will stumble over the brother, but why they stumble? Because the other did the sin, not because I did the sin. I mean, these 45 men didn't do sins, at least how they look on their faces, they look like angels. But why do they stumble? Because of sins of others. Now, why would I get punished because of your sin? So the Talmud says something very interesting. Be'avon achiv in the sin of his brother, bigal she'achiv asavon, because his brother, we're all brothers, did a sin, hem naflu, then they fell. The Talmud is coming to tell me here that we're all our uh, guarantors of each other. You know, it says, We are guarantors of each other. But what's the simple explanation of, the, of that we're guarantors? Then the Talmud says, Because there wasn't a protest. If somebody now is here, a person talking bad about another person, and the person who hears doesn't protest, he's just as guilty. Sometimes people sin and there's no protest. What is he saying here? But there's no protest. Then when I see somebody doing something bad, I'm not protesting. Why are you saying that? Why are you doing that? Why are you behaving like that? Why are you uh, desecrating Shabbat? Why are you stealing? Why are you slandering? This is the pshat. But here comes something even more interesting. Uh, a quick explanation. I mean, the Talmud comes to exp I'm saying what I'm saying now is a side note. The Talmud is coming to explain the Mishnah. The Mishnah was written by Rabbi Yudana. See, he compiled all the Mishnayot together and he, he composed the, the Mishnah. But there are Mishnayot that came later on. They found, you know, papers like this. So these are called Braitot. These are the editions. So it says in the Braita of Masechet Shvuot. And it says, and what is it talking about in this specific Braita? It's talking about the severity, the severity when you're lying under oath. Or basically saying when you're lying. And it says, All the sins in the Torah, the one who sinned, he gets punished. Bishvuat shaker, when you lie, 
כל המשפחה נענשת. No family gets punished. So you lie and I get punished. He says, please stop lying. That's what the Brighter says, I'm not saying that. Now interestingly, then the Brighter quotes a verse from the Torah in the book of Dvarim, chapter uh, 24, verse uh, 16. Lo yumtu avot al banim ve banim lo yumtu al avot. Translation, the fathers won't die over the sons and the sons won't die over the fathers. That's the translation. Ish bechet o yamut. A person will die because of his own sins. But when it comes to Shvuat Shav, lying, then fathers will die over the kids, which exactly what happened. Fathers were leaning over the kids to protect them, and either the fathers died, or the kids will die over the fathers. This is, this is unbelievable. This is exactly what was going on there. So we have the first explanation that people mistreat each other. And therefore, they're all falling on each other, st st standing over each other, st st stamping over each other. I say stamping, stomping, stomping over each other. And here it takes us to another whole new uh, uh, way of looking at it. That's how much lying is going on. When it comes to lying, then you can lie and I get punished. So here, this is the first quote from the first Gemara. Then we have another Gemara. I'm not going to get too much into that, into that story, it's long, but you can look at it, it's in Tracted Shabbat, page 60, and it's talking about that the Roman soldiers, they used to have uh, sandals. And what did they do with the sandals? The sandal, the bottom was made out of wood, and to connect the leather to the wood, they would take nails and bang the leather, in the, the nail through the leather, through the wood. And then the soldiers would walk with those sandals and it had nails in it. So if they would stand on somebody, that was another type of a weapon. Okay? This is called sandal ha-mesumar. The sandal that has nails stuck in it. Anyways, the story is that the, the Romans came to attack. And what happened is that a lot of the people, uh, that they were hiding in a cave... And uh, kind of like in today, when there's missiles, where do you go? You go to, the, to a shelter. So then there wasn't missiles, maybe there was arrows. So they all went into a cave. And when they heard the Romans coming, from the fear, the ones in the out, outside of the cave pushed everybody in and killed the ones that are inside. And they stepped all over them. And what does the Talmud says? Vehargu ze et ze. And they killed each other, I'm talking about the Jews, they were hiding in the, in the cave. Which is already, you know, you see all these connections, because in, in Meron, is, there's a cave there. And it says, And they killed each other, More than what the enemy actually killed them. They killed each other. Now here comes another hint. How many people died in Meron? 45. It says, And they killed each other. Yoter, more. From what? Mima. Ma is mem hey, 45. And the whole story here? A bunch of people standing in a, in a narrow corridor, in a cave, and they're all pushing each other and they killed each other. But what it says, Yoter, Mima. This is not like proper Hebrew, by the way. And a hint here, Mima, what's Mima? Mem he is 45. So we have two uh, Gemarot, two places in the Talmud talking about this. Now let's see where it takes us. Just us remember these two Gemarot, okay? Now, it says in the Zohar, I mean, after all, what are we, what are we celebrating on Lag Baomer? The, 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 the completion of the cycle of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who wrote the Zohar, and it says in the book of Shemot, uh, page 36, no, uh, uh, six, uh, Tedvav, uh, 15b, this is as in the Zohar, let milta derim, dermiza beoraita. Every word that is written in the Torah has a hint for something that is going to happen. There's no such a word, even if the word says ma, there's a hint for it for something that's going to happen. There's, the Torah is like, a, the whole Torah is prophecies of what's going to happen. So, let's go now, focus on the parasha, exactly when Lag Bomer happened, which is Parashat Emor, right? 
Go to Book of Vayikra. Is this in Parashat Emor? Chapter 4, uh, 24, verse 19. And it says as follows. Ve'ish ki ten mum ba'amito. And a man who inflicts an injury upon his fellow man. When? Ka'asher asa ken yaselo. Just as he did, so shall will be done to him. You step on somebody else, you'll be stepped on. That's how it works. So what does it say here? And a man who inflicts an injury upon his fellow. How did they die? Because they were standing on each other. This is already not an injury. This is already death. But this is what it says in the parasha when the whole thing happened. And again, I don't like the translation. I never like the translation. Because is that when I mum is a, is a blemish. Here it says inflict. It's a blemish. If I punch somebody, I make a blemish. It's a mum. Kasher, when? What I do, it will come back to me. That's how it is. What, how do you say in English? What comes around, goes around, what goes around, comes around. That's it. What you do to others, that's what's going to happen to you. And what's, what's happening here? Then we're people standing on each other. That's really what's going on here. Torah is coming and telling me everybody's standing on each other's honor, the respect. And in Hebrew, of course, it sa sounds much more accurate. That's what happens. Nobody cares about the honor and the respect of others. But very interestingly, if you're taking the words in this verse, ki ve'ish, ki ten mumba mitoka asher, when a man, and a man who inflicts an injury upon his fellow, go to the last letter of each one of these words, this is called sofeotiot, and you get the word meron. Ki, you have the yud, iten, you have the nun, mum, you have the mem, Ba'amito, you have the Vav, Ka'asher, you have the Reish, Meron. Now there's no coincidences or flukes. So Torah, the Zohar says, every word in the Torah has a hint. So we have a hint. When you're stepping on each other, when you have zero tolerance and respect to others, and you're stepping upon each other, and you're putting a blemish in. If I go and slander you, that's a pretty, pretty big blemish that I do to you. Maybe not physically, but there's a blemish. Or inflict an injury. Injury doesn't have to be necessarily physical. Then that's, uh, that's what happens. And the same way that you treat others, that's what's going what's to happen to you at the end of days. So again, we have another hint. Let's continue. No one that's class to be too long. The point is just to get the point. If we're going back to Parashat Bechukotai, chapter 26, verse 37, Lamed Zayn, and it says as follows, Velo tiye lachem tekuma. Translation, you will not be able to stand up. And that's exactly what was going on there. When people had 40, 50, 60 people standing on them, they won't be able to stand up. But if you're taking the word in Hebrew tekuma, which again, the translation stand up, tekuma means to be able to stand up. Then break the word into the first three letters. So you have taf, kuf, vav. And then you have again the word ma, which ma is the numerical value of 45. And the taf, kuf, vav is the, what's called teko, is what we cannot grasp. Because people were asking, why did this happen? What did these 45 holy souls did? Why is Hashem doing this to us? People are going, banging their head at the wall for a whole week. Why, why, why? This is what we can't understand. So the word kuma, you have the teku, ma. And you're not going to understand why Hashem took 45. This is for Hashem to understand. But very, very interestingly here, if you focusing on these verses, and at home later on, read all the verses from 33, go to at least like 42, 43, 45. Just read it. But if you're going from that place, 99 letters, you jump from 99 letters. This is called, when people want to see hints in the Torah, there's what we just said now, Sofeotiot, the last letter of every word. There's Rasheotiot, the, the first letter of every word. But there's also what's called Dilugotiot. A lot of people who look in the Torah codes, there's a, a rabbi, I think his name is uh, 
Glazerson, thank you. He does online the Torah codes. And you see, he has a software, and you see sometimes a hint when there's what's called the dilugotiot, that you find a word when you're jumping the same amount of words. Okay? So if you're jumping 99 letters, this is what you get. If you're going to, uh, this you can do later, don't look at it right now. Chapter 26 in Parashat Berukotai, from uh, ver uh, uh, verse uh, Mem, and it says, Vehitvadu et Avonam. That's where it starts. What does it, say? what does it mean? They will then confess their iniquity. Remember we spoke about on Shabbat how important it is to confess. Be a man, just confess. Don't start pretending it wasn't me, it wasn't my fault, I was under pressure. Excuse my language. Shut up and just confess for what you did. Just step forward and say, I, I, I'm guilty. Who are you kidding? But see, here he says something very interesting. Because it says, Ve'et avon avotam bema'alam halchu imi keri. I mean, this is the end of the verse. Read the whole verse. What does it say? It says that they had to confess their inequity, but the sins of their fathers, and at the end, halchu imi keri, I mean, the trans I don't even read the translation because the, tra the translation doesn't make sense. Halchu iti keri, keri comes from the word in Hebrew, mikre. Mikre means by chance. There's no hand of God happened here. This is what it means, that people say, no, 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 there's no uh, divine intervention here. It's a, it's a, it was a, a coincidence. It just happened to be. Hashem says, you're telling me that something is a coincidence, so it happened by mistake? That's a lechti tibakeri. Don't say it's a mistake. It was the hand of God that did that, and Hashem doesn't like that. Now it says here, ma'alubi, they went against me. This is what's called their betrayal. Ma'alu bi ve'af. This is where you have to follow the, the verses. We're going to try maybe on the editing to put all the verses. But uh, for you, if you're following the text. So if you are starting to jump 99 letters, and I'll tell you from which letters, this is just a hint that how did we, why 99? Because first of all, we have 98 curses, so we have one over the curses. But in the, ver in the words where it says their betrayal, because Hashem says, you st saying it was uh, not the hand of God, you're going against me. How can you go against me? I'm Hashem, getting against Hashem, not against me. So the words ma'alu bi ve'af, if you take the words bi in me, ve'af, and the anger of Hashem gives you the number of 99. So now we're going to start jumping 99 letters. So... You can follow in the, in, the, in the verses. In the word kuma, this is where we start counting. Lachem kuma, you're not going to be able to stand up. From the letter mem, count 99 letters, you're going to get to the word et avonam, to their sin. So confessing to their sin. So the 99th letter is the ayn of avonam. And count another 99 letters, and you get to the word ve'az yiratzu, or az yirtzu. So the reish of Ritzu, then they will ask or request and go another 99 letters and the word is mehem, behashama mehem. Then you get the word me'ara in the cave. Mem, ein, yud, eh, sorry, mem, ein, reish and hey. And why is it so important, dafka, the word me'ara? Because exactly what happened in, the, in Meron, or the cave of Meron, is what happened in Tractate Shabbat that I told you they were all squished into a, a cave. So there's nowhere to go, not to the left, not to the right, and not forward. So the ones who are coming in are pushing everything. That's exactly what happened in Meron. It looked a little bit different if you looked from above. But it's the same idea. What's interesting here is the numerical value of uh, 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 99 is the numerical value of a word, Yig Alena will be redeemed, or will redeem. And like I told you, that 45 is the numerical value of Geula, of redemption. So, the hint that we're getting here, lo yet kuma, the person will not be able to stand up. Can you imagine the person who's on the ground, and he wants to get up, wants to save himself, and there's so much people on top of him, they can't get up, he can't move. Can you imagine the frustration? Can you imagine the anxiety? <laughs> you can't breathe, and you, you can't even move the people... People were piled on top of each other. Wasn't it somebody just fell? People were piled on top of each other. If you see some of the footage, people were like pulled out. 
Can you imagine what's going on in the person's mind? The fear. The, 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 you know, in Hebrew it's called choser onim, the, 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 you're helpless. And there's so much pressure on the lungs, the lungs, you can't even scream, help, move, anything. Just imagine what's going on in this person's mind. Shem Yerachem. Now, interestingly here, this I'm just going to say it as a side note, but in, the, in, in verse 22, it says, "Vehishlachti b'chem et chayat asadeh." And again, this is part of the curses. It says, "I will incite the wild beasts of the field." So we're thinking of, you know, wolves. So I don't know, uh, tigers, whatever it is. But the Talmud says, and specifically in this case, the chayat asadeh, the wild beasts. This is the Romaim, the Romans. And how did the Talmud get to it? Because a sav was the father of Edom, he was in the field, and he's the, the, the head or the father of the Romans. And I'm not talking about the ones who live in Rome, I'm talking about the, the real Romans that are our biggest enemy, enemy right now, that in our generation, again, it's not the ones who are serving pizza in Napoli. I'm talking about the Romans from the Vatican that are running the, 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 the entire world. So I'm just finding this as, a fi as an interesting uh, hint. We're not going to get into that, but for the ones who were at Meron at the night of Lag Baomer, and some of you probably saw it online, the whole place was full of the, the, the pyramids. I don't know if you saw it in the pictures or not, everywhere you looked in Meron was the Illuminati's pyramids. Everywhere. And people took pictures of it. Why, what does what the pyramids got to do with Meron? Why? Because the Romaim, the Illuminati, they control everything, especially the land of Israel. And they're running the show. So I just found it very, uh, I'll use now the word ironic, that the part of the Klalot is that Hashem says, I will send to you the, the, the translation, the wild beasts of the field. But the Talmud says, this is the Romans, not the animals. I'm going to send these individuals to be your enemy and they will bring you down. Which really, I know it's, a lot of people don't like hearing it, but these are the ones who planned this whole thing. I told you, this was planned and it was a murder. But anyways, let's go back to our verses. Very interestingly, here again, another hint. And this is no chance. And don't dare to say a chance because I just told you that Hashem says, if you're saying it's a chance, you're going with me, Bekeri? That's when I really lose it. The verse that we're reading is what verse? Lamed Gimel, 33. Don't say a chance. This is not by mistake that we're reading verse Lamed Gimel. In which chapter? 26. Now what's the significance of chapter 26? The whole day was to commemorate the passing of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, right? How many years did Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai learn in a cave? 13 years. Well, 12, then he went out, came back for another year. 13 is the numerical value of the word Ahava, love, which we all can apply a little bit more to our fellow friends. Another numerical value with the number 13 is Echad. Now when we say Shema Yisrael, what do we say? Ve'ahavta et Hashem Elokecha, right? You should love your God. And at the end, Hashem Echad. So Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, what he did with his deep, profound meaning, teachings, is to connect love with one. And this is a big problem that we have, is that we are not one. We are very separated and there's no love. So you have 13 of the numerical value of love and 13 of the numerical value of Echad and you have 26. So in chapter 26, in verse 33, I don't know about you, I, I see very clear uh, uh, hints here. But it's all about the connection and that's what Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai really did. This is called Yehud Ha'ila'ah. The connection, a supreme or an exalted connection, connecting love and one or connected to be one through love. Now, interestingly here, just to conclude, um, now all that we're focusing here is on the curses of the parasha of the curses in the Torah. How many curses do you have? Quick test. How much? No, I said that 15 minutes ago. How many curses we have? How much? 98. 98 is the numerical value of the word Chinam. Chinam, the translation is free, but what other connotation we have with the word Chinam? We have either 
שנאת חינם, או we have אהבת חינם. שנאת חינם is a baseless hate. You have baseless hate, this is what we are experiencing, you're going to experience 98 curses. I rest my case. Shem is telling us in clear words, you did it to yourself. I did it. I'm speaking now, I can't speak in the name of God, but I'm saying, Hashem says, I did it. I run the show. Don't think for one second that this is a mistake, a chance, an accident. I allowed it to happen by the hands of who? The Chayat Asadeh, the, the beast of the field, which are the Romans. I'll send them to bite you. They're going to bite you. But why? Because of Sinat Chinam. You have baseless hate, that's what you're going to get. It's very, very simple. You step on each other, then you are going to stay in exile. Chas v'shalom. Now these 45 holy souls that were murdered, I don't think they had that problem. They just went as an atonement. Because if I lie, if I slander, if I cheat and steal and desecrate Shabbat and hate other people, and can I be can considered complete or whole? We spoke about it on Shabbat. It's called Tamim, right? I'm not. I'm full of damages because I lie and I cheat and I slander and I hate and so forth. So I'm not whole. I'm not a perfect sacrifice. But these 45 holy souls were perfect sacrifices. It's called Ola Timima. Ola means a sacrifice, a, a, a korban. But Tamim, it has to be perfect. So Hashem chose 45 perfect souls that you see on their faces, and if you read about them and learn about each and every one of them, rabbis, huge scholars, kids that were like angels. And Hashem chose perfect ones. He could have chose also anyone. No, Hashem says, no, no, no. If I'm taking sacrifices, they're going to be perfect. They didn't do anything wrong. We did something wrong. We lie, what the Talmud says, we lie, then they get punished. So the point that we need to take from that it's our fault. And I don't like people who are brushing off responsibility. No, take responsibility. Right? That's what, the, what, the, what it says in the, in, the, in the verses that we're reading here. You have to, to confess your sin. Who am I kidding? I can't stand you. Not you. But if I need to do a cheshbon, an account with myself, sometimes I look at another person and in my heart, I'm like, I can't stand this guy. Why? Because he's smarter. He's younger, he's handsome, he's rich, he has a beautiful wife. I like his wife, so I can't stand him. I mean, let's cut to the chase here. Nobody can stand each other. That's the sinat chinam. Now, the thing is that where does the lie come in? Because I, hi, how are you? You look amazing. That's great. I, I missed you so much. You liar. Say it straight in the face. I can't stand you. Now, I'm not telling you now to go in the street and start telling people I can't stand you. That will cause more sinna. But who are you lying? It says clearly, and what I'm telling you right now, there's so much more hints in the text. I'm doing it short because I really want to make a kind of short class. There's so much more hints here. You can't even fathom how many hints are in all these parashot and the words. and You can't even imagine. But I want to keep it simple. And that's why I quoted the, the Talmud of Shvot, because it says, you lie, your brother will get punished. So stop lying. Who are you kidding? You know who you're lying to? You're lying to yourself. Oh, I love everybody. No, you don't. You can't stand this guy because he has more money than you. And you can't stand that guy because he's from a different religious group. And you can't stand this guy because he's Jewish or not Jewish or a, a religious, not religious. Velo tisna et bilvavecha. This is a direct commandment from God in the Torah, you should not hate your brother in your heart. So Hashem is telling us very simple. The sinat chinam, you hate each other, you stepping all over each other, you don't care of the respect and the honor of others, and that's what you're going to get. You want geula? People are screaming all day long, we want the Mashiach. Well, let's see what you can do. And this has nothing to do right now, Jews, non-Jews, religious, non-religious, observant, because 
Everybody kind of hates each other. Now, what's the solution? Some people will tell me, should I not or hate or a terrorist that is coming to kill me? What's the thing I'd want to do with it? That's the questions people tell me. Somebody got raped, should he not hate the rapist? I'm not talking about that. Of course, if somebody was raped, lo aleinu chas v'shalom, or molested, or... I'm not telling you to love that person. So somebody else asked me the other day, because I told him the same thing. How is about... If I see somebody desecrating Shabbat or they're not observant, should I hate them? No, I didn't tell you to hate them. First of all, you have to rebuke them. That's what it says. Shalom Michu. Remember I told you there wasn't a, a protest. But you have to do it with love. Not throw a rock at a car and scream Shabbos. That's not how you protest. But if I see somebody doing something bad, then go and protest. But in a, in a, in a way of love. Reach out to the person. And if you can, then stay back. But don't hate the person. You can hate the person's actions, but don't hate the person's soul. So the first thing I want to conclude, because there's another thing I want you to take from this class, is that each and every one of us has to take some time to themselves and say, do I really, really have love to other people, unconditional love, or am I failing with sinat chinam? And the majority of us are failing in Sinat Chinam. That's how it is. Sinat Chinam means baseless hate. And I told you, there's no, there's not, not by chance that there are 98 curses. Because 98 is the numerical value of the word Chinam. Chinam means free. But you can either have Sinat Chinam, and then you fail miserably, and the, you bring on yourself these 98 curses, Chas V'Shalom, or you have Avat Chinam. I don't even know who you are. And you know what? You maybe weren't there to see it. You know what the Avat Chinam people had in that disaster? You know that people that live in Meron ripped their doors out of the hinges so they can carry pe wounded people on the doors because there wasn't even a pathway for the, for the ambulances to come in? People were risking their lives, jumping into the crowd to pull other people. People were carrying people on their, on their own bodies. Then you see Avat Chinam. The people don't know each other. They come to rescue and save other people. But why do we have to wait for a disaster to behave like that? <laughs> so we need to take from that that first of all, don't think for one second, accident, mistake. Hashem says, are you telling an accident? I'm telling you that I did this. Shem says, I do. Don't, they don't dare to say an accident. Oh, what a horrible accident. No, it, it, it is horrible. Don't take my words out of context, but Hashem says, I did it. I designed it to show you how you look, stepping all over each other. That's how you look. Can you imagine? Step aside and look at the crowd and you see how people step all over each other. And this is a term, stepping all over each other, not talking physically. So Hashem says, okay, you're doing it in a metaphorical way. Now I'm going to show you how you do, how you're killing each other when you're physically stepping on each other. When I go and slander other people, yeah, I'm stepping all over, their, all over them. And that really kills them. And different leaders will say kills me. First lesson to, continue, to conclude from all this is that Hashem is telling us clearly, you want the geula, you want redemption in the same numerical value of 45? Then this cannot continue. This cannot continue, this baseless hate. This hate and resentment and slandering and gossiping and lying to each other and... It has to stop. Lesson number one. Lesson number two is not going to be like now one hour. It will take me exactly one minute to explain to you. That was the first thing that struck me. Stroke, strike me. How do you say strike, stroke? The first thing that hit me when I saw 45. Because, you know, the, the, the number of the dead was going up. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. It was just... But it stopped at 45. And the first thing that came up to my mind, 45, to the ones who learn a little bit of Kabbalah, is right away Shema, right? There are four ways how you can write Yudke Vavke, the name of Hashem, which is numerical value of 26. But if you write it, in, and you spread the letters and you write the letters, then you get four combinations. Really, you can get 12. I told you already, I promised you many times, we'll do a class about all 12 combinations. But Shema is the numerical value of 45. So that, first of all, Hit me. Now, where do you find uh, per, uh, uh, the word Ma in the Torah that is very, very powerful? Go to the book of Darim, chapter 10, verse 12. And it says, Ve'ata Yisrael, listen to me, O Israel. Ma, Ma, 
השם אלוקיך שואל מעמך. What does God want from you? כי אם ליראה את השם אלוקיך, fear God and only God. Book of Devarim, chapter 10, verse 12, go read the whole verse, where Hashem tells you, you know what I want from you? I want you to fear only me. Only fear the Lord your God. Don't fear other people. And of course, go in his path and do the mitzvot and so forth. And that's the problem that we have very obvious in the last year, that people fear a virus. People fear a government. People fear a 500 shekel fine. Are you afraid of a half 500 shekel fine? Because you didn't wear a diaper on your face? Well, luckily now, they're not bothering us with the diapers anymore. Now they're announcing, that's it. The green passport is not going to have any, any meaning. No more restrictions. I can't even imagine what they're cooking for us right now. But the point is that in the last year and a half, all I saw with most people that they fear everything but God. And Hashem tells us with this incident, stop fearing governments. Stop fearing viruses, doctors, threats by authorities. Fear me and only me. That's what it says. Only to fear the Lord your God. Sorry to tell you, if you're afraid of the police or the Department of Health or the CDC or the WHO or whatever, who cares? Then I'm sorry to tell you, that's, that's a big slap to the face to the master of the universe. You fear God. And I know there'll be a lot of arguments, but you have to do an effort to protect yourself. I'm not talking about the efforts you need to do. I'm telling you to fear God. And that's the problem that most people don't have. They don't fear God. They're afraid. What is the, what's going to happen? I'm going to get fired because I didn't take my shot. What, are you afraid of a boss? I'm afraid of God. People lost their fear of God. So we're not going to make a whole lecture out of that. But that's the first thing that... I saw, when I saw the 45, because it says clear in the Torah, Vata Israel, listen to me, O Israel, Ma Hashem Elokecha Shoel Mimach. What does Hashem ask from you? And that Shem Ma, this 45, Hashem says, yeah, I want you to fear me. And after you fear me, everything else becomes this big. Needless to say, people need to take precautions. You're not allowed to put yourself in a place of danger. There's a barrage of missiles. You're not standing in the street like this and saying, I'm fearing Hashem. You go into a bomb shelter. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that you put all your fear to Hashem. I lie, you're going to get punished for that. I slander, there's going to be a reaction. I desecrate Shabbat, I don't eat kosher, doesn't matter. There's going to be precautions when you think Hashem is just going to forget about it. So we have two profound lessons to take from this incident and I hope that people can not only internalize it but also to, to apply that and to understand that the severity of Sinat Chinam, of this baseless hate, is what's killing us. The Pirut Levavot, that the hearts are separated, that we're not united and I told you that not once and not twice. Up until about a year ago, the Sinat Chinam was if you're Sephardi or Ashkenazi or if you're from this group or that group or how you dress, now the new Sinat Chinam is, is if you are vaccinated or if you're not vaccinated. Or if you're wearing a mask or you're not wearing, are you pro-vaccine or you are uh, against Corona? That's the new Sinat Chinam. People hate each other because one is vaccinated while the other one is not. Oh, don't agree. You don't have to agree with me. You know, people hate me. They don't have to agree with me. But why you hate me? I don't hate you. I don't agree with most people. But I don't hate them. I choose to disagree. The whole Torah is full of disagreements. But I don't hate you for that. I'm going to mock you. I'm going to ridicule you in public. This is a brand new Sinat Chinam that we have. So first, internalize that if we are not going to be united, we're going to continue seeing another disaster and another disaster and another disaster. And it's all going to be done by Chayat HaSadeh, by the way. Hashem says, I will send to you the, the beast of the field, right? Et so, so some might say, oh, Hashem didn't do it, they did it. No, 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 no. Hashem released them. And the, the translation is the wild beast of the field, but the Talmud says, no, 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 these are the Romaim. And I'm not talking about the ones from Rome. Oh, well, they are in Rome, in the Vatican. But I'm talking about the evil regime that are coming against you, to kill you. 
And the next, like I told you, we have to have only fear from Hashem, and we have to have fear from Hashem. Forget it, that's, you know, let me separate it into two categories. First, you have to have fear from Hashem and not from people. But most people don't even have fear from Hashem. It's, if you believe in God, this is a mind-boggling to me, if you believe in God and you hold yourself as an observant individual, Jew or non-Jew, it doesn't matter, it's the same God. How can you sin? How can you sin if you fear God? So you don't fear God. You're not a God-fearing individual. Sometimes people tell me, you're religious. Whoa, 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 whoa. Don't call me names. I'm not religious. Religion is not a nice word. It's a man-made concept. I'm a God-fearing individual. God-fearing Jew, call me whatever you want. Ani Yehudi Yereshamayim. I fear God. Religion, that's a man-made thing. Men, man invented religion. Judaism is not a religion. This is a way of life. I, I serve the master of the universe. I don't like when people call me, you're religious. Well, uh -huh. I'm a God-fearing individual. At least I'm trying to be God-fearing. So most people are not God-fearing because if you do sins, how, how, who are you fearing exactly? You know, fear God. The question is, uh, you know, the test is how you behave at home. Uh, next to people, you behave like a good kid or a good individual at home. Let's see how you behave in closed doors when nobody sees you. Then that's the, the God-fearing is tested there. So we'll break the... The Leirait Hashem Elokecha, fear your God, is uh, first fear God and not humans. Put all your trust in God and not in humans. That's mind boggling, mind boggling to me. You put your trust, you put your health in the hands of people. Put your trust in the hands of God. And I know that people will manipulate it and say, of course I trust in God, but I'm doing my effort and therefore I'm trusting in people. Ah, David Amelech says, Aruch Gever Shivtach Ba'adam. Right? David Amalek says in Tilim, Damn is the man who trusts in another man. You put Hashem as your security. You believe in Hashem. And then, of course, you question yourself, how, how God-fearing are you? Are you really a God-fearing individual? Because when the storm is going to come very soon, what do we say every day? Are Hayom, that's not talking about today. Hayom, uh, the translation is today. Hayom is the day that Hashem will reveal Himself. The day. Hayom. So only if you're holding on, Vikim means that I'm glued, I'm, you know, holding Hashem like this. Then you'll survive the storm and you'll be alive in that day. In the day that Hashem will reveal Himself to the universe. But uh, if you're not fearful from Hashem, who says you're going to survive? Yeah, yeah, you have a guarantee. I don't know of my, how many people will survive. Well, the ones who are fearing Hashem. And if you really fear Hashem, then you don't lie, and you don't slander, and you don't gossip, and you don't steal, and you don't carry hate to other people, and you follow what the Torah tells you to the best of your abilities. I'm not uh, t expecting, Hashem is not expecting robots. He knows we're going to fail. But to the best of your ability, just be a mensch, as they say. So I want to take this sad incident as a strong message that Hashem is giving to us clearly what we need to do in order to reach to a state of Geula, the numerical value of 45, that Hashem says, you want Geula? You want to be in a state of freedom, mental freedom, spiritual freedom, emotional freedom? Then uh, get your act together and get it fast. Because we didn't even get up from, people didn't get up from the Shiva of mourning the death. Boom, right away, attack! from our enemies. Barrages of missiles, riots everywhere. Now people saying, okay, that's Israel. No, it's not only Israel. It's very scary for the Jews in New York now, right now, and Johannesburg, and in Montreal, and Los Angeles. Yesterday I spoke with a good friend of mine. He told me, I don't care about the corona, the vaccines. That's not what's worrying me. It's the anti-Semitism that I'm worried about in New York. People are afraid to walk in the street with a yarmulke in New York. New York! Which, as I said many times, Mashaya, Ushie, that's what happened in Germany 85 years ago. 90 years ago, everybody walked in the street with tzitzit, yarmulke, mezuzot on the door, yeshivot, kosher butchers. It got to a point that people didn't walk with yarmulkes in the streets of Frankfurt, Berlin, and... <laughs> Who, who dared to walk with a Jewish identity? And this dear friend of mine says, I'm afraid, forget about the corona, I don't care about the corona. I care about the, 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 the anti-Semitism. 
So it's everywhere. If it starts in Israel, it ripples to the world. So we need to get our act together very fast because now the waves are going to come much, much faster. I can't even wait to see what's going to be next after this so-called ceasefire, some ceasefire. So I take this message very, very uh, uh, strong. I hope I was able to relay a little bit of the, the importance of what we need to do. I know it sounds like a broken record, Sinat Chinam, Lashon but nothing seems to change. So hopefully, maybe now, people will be able to apply that. The thing is that each and every one of you have to not look around what other people are doing. So to close yourself in a room, or better off to go to some big open field with no boundaries, and to say to yourself, where am I failing? What can I do? And don't think that your change will not affect the entire world. One person can affect the entire world. When I take on myself to really respect others, I don't agree with you. I respect you. I will not ridicule you. I will not mock you. And then needless to say, not go and, go and slander your name and gossip about you. I don't have to agree with you. As they say, the famous uh, say, quote in English, let's agree to disagree. That's it. Don't have to agree. Just today somebody told me, uh, we were talking about the new app that we're doing, and I said there's going to be a, a Sidur on the app. And, and, and until Mashiach is going to come, we still have Nosach Sfarad and Nosach Ashkenaz. So we're going to have to have two Sidurim for the Ashkenazim and the Sfaradim. And this person says, why do you have to have two Sidurim? Why can't we all have one Sidur? So I said, okay, that's what's going to happen and Mashiach is going to come. But there's a reason why there's Sephardi and Ashkenaz. And one of the many reasons is that let's see how you can respect each other even though you are serving the same God in different paths. So what if you read in this type and I read in that type? That shouldn't bring us to hate each other. You teach me, I'll teach you, let's uh, join together. So I'm hoping that the words were a little bit clear. I, this is, a, I, I mean, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There are so many other hints and, and messages but I think this is pretty clear, pretty loud. Hopefully we'll be able to do some type of a change. And this change starts within you. Not to look around at others. Is what do I can do to change it? I guarantee to you that if you do the change, by default it will affect other people. Because the positive power of your change will affect positive other people. And needless to say that you spreading love and unity and light in the world, then by default it will diminish the darkness in the world that is taking over. And Bezad Hashem, we can experience the redemption, but with kindness and with love and compassion and not chas v'shalom with disasters. So I will bless you all, including myself, that we should have real yirat shamayim, real fear of God, real love to others, in quotations, even if I don't agree with them, and we'll be able to do serious tshuva for our sins, so to be able to rectify that and to change the world and make the world a much better place with me spreading unity and love and light and applying what the Torah says. Because before all the curses that we read in this parasha, look at all the beautiful blessings if we go in the path of God. So now Hashem is telling us, Jews and non-Jews do, go in the path of God. Because that's the only way to bring unity, love, and needless to say, to bring the redemption Bechesed v'achamim, with kindness and with love, and Bezad Hashem, we should experience it very soon in our days. Amen.